about three recent Monte Carlo transport developments at Livermore. And um, yeah, a little bit more, I'm, I'm, my title is computational physicist, but I did get my degree in nuclear engineering. I uh, did my bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Uh, I work in design physics division at Livermore. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to first give a little background into Livermore, so you're not familiar with the lab, and give a, give a quick, you know, elevator pitch as to why you know, I can see someone like to work there, why I like working there the last couple of years. Then in terms of technical topics, I'm going to talk about some GPU porting and performance work that we've been doing and will continue to do for many years in our two uh, Monte Carlo cars, Mercury and Imp. And then uh, I'm going to talk about improved photon transport in Mercury through our uh, addition of treatments for elliptically polar polarized photons. And then I'm going to talk about improved coupling between Imp and hydrogen M's codes in curvilinear coils. Now, I just want to say off the bat that I worked on all these topics, but they were done in collaboration with both staff and students at Livermore. Our, our GPU work is something that we've invested a lot of resources in for Monte Carlo transport. It's a challenging topic. And we're just now starting to see some pretty good performance improvements. Uh, the other two topics, elliptical polarization and uh, improved hydrodynamics coupling, were probably mm -hmm. said I was in charge of, but um, I did work with other staff members and the, the polarization was work that I that was done partially by a master's student at Texas a &M. And then myself and a summer student finished this work this past summer. And we'll be giving a, a talk on it at the ANS conference this coming summer. So for a little more background, uh, Livermore is one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories. And so I have them classified here between science and technology labs. And Livermore is one of three uh, multi-purpose national security labs, which include Los Alamos and San Diego. And um, these labs are located all across the country. And in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, we have a clustering of a few, Lawrence Livermore being one of those. This picture doesn't quite do it justice, but this, this lab is pretty close to the Bay Area. So I actually live about five minutes from the lab. And if I go a mile past the lab, I get to vineyards. A uh, 40 minute drive gets me to the ocean, 45 minute drive gets me to San Francisco, and a 40 minute drive gets me to Oakland. If you like hiking, there's tons of coastal hiking nearby. And in the wintertime, I love going out to Lake Tahoe to do some skiing. It's only about a three hour drive. So, from my experience living there for the last couple of years, it's got a little something for everybody. So, I, I've really enjoyed working at the lab just for. Not only for the technical work, but for the extra uh, This is an aerial photo of the lab. So this, this lab was established in 1952, shortly after World War II. It currently has about 7,500 employees. And it's located on this about one mile, one square mile plot of land in the east side of Livermore. Uh, the annual operating budget is about $2.3 billion. And it's currently being operated by an LLC called Lawrence Livermore National Security. As I mentioned, I'm a computational physicist in design physics division. And personnel in this division work on a wide range of applications, which include explosion physics, inertial fusion. So you might have heard of NIF. We do the modeling for a lot of NIF uh, work. And then uh, multi physics simulations. So to accomplish, to accomplish work in these, these projects, uh, we leverage a wide range of expertise. Uh, I've shown some of the expertise areas on the left, and I've, all, I've highlighted the ones that are relevant to UW-Madison, at least that I thought were relevant. So computational physics, plasma physics, and then the topic that I worked in, which was radiation and particle transport. So within design physics division, there's a program called Weapon Simulation and Computing Program. This is the program that I do most of my work in, and it's the program that the Monte Carlo Transport Project is, is a member of. And the goal of this program is to develop general purpose multi physics software that runs efficiently on all emerging HPC architectures. So I'm one of 165 people working in this uh, program, and all of our teams, this is an interesting feature a little more. All of our teams are multidisciplinary. So we have people with PhD computer science, people with PhDs in physics, people with PhDs in engineering. 
And uh, we, you know, we currently have strong collaborations with other national labs to accomplish our program goal, industry partners, and uh, universities. I just want to say too that we're currently looking to hire quite a few new people. Um, we have a lot of retirements coming down the line, so we need to fill up those those positions. Uh, at Livermore in general, there's quite a few employment opportunities, which include summer internships. That's something I like to see Madison participate more in, in the future. And then uh, graduate student fellowships, postdoctoral fellowships, and career positions. If you're still doing your research and you think a career's a way off, we do also with formal collaborations, formal collaborations with students and universities. And we also have something we call in, in residence graduate study. So in our team in particular, we had a student who was researching GPU performance um, topics. And so he worked with our group for several years to finish his PhD. So for those of you interested, uh, I highly recommend that you go to this website and get some of the offerings that we have. Otherwise, just reach out to me directly. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So on to our first technical topic. I want to talk about our GPU porting and performance work up to our Monte Carlo codes, Mercury and Hamper. Now, Mercury is our next generation general purpose Monte Carlo transport code that we're developing at Livermore. And this code, you can think of it kind of similar to MCMP. We just don't distribute it as widely to the public. And with it, we can transport neutrons, photons, and light elements, including hydrogen and helium. Uh, IMP is a little bit different. It is our standard, well, it's our IMC code. But what that means is it's, it implements the standard implicit Monte Carlo uh, algorithm for modeling thermal radiative transfer. Now, this one is a little bit different than Mercury because we have it structured like a library that we can then integrate into some of the hydrodynamics codes that we have in Mercury. I'm going to be talking about that more in our third talk. Now, both of these codes, we've been working to port the GPUs. We have ported the GPUs. And then um, we can make performance out, out of those on the GPUs as the challenge. So why are we so interested in running these codes on GPUs? Well, our current flagship machine, which is called Sierra, has about 4,200 nodes. Each of those nodes has 40 power nine CPU cores and four voltage GPUs. Now those voltage GPUs make up about 90% of Sierra's flops. And machines that are gonna come after this are gonna be even more tilted towards uh, GPU flops. So if you wanna be able to run on next-gen architectures, your code has to be able to leverage GPUs efficiently. Any of you have ever looked into this topic or done some research of your own, you're probably well aware that creating a money for a performance well on GPUs is a challenge. Um, now, our initial approach to GPU porting was just to take our algorithm, which was just history based transport. For those of you who are familiar with Monte Carlo, you just basically model what the particle does until it's either um, absorbed, exits your problem domain, or you know, is killed through this, due to some sort of variance reduction technique. Um, now, we first got that working, that algorithm working on the GPUs. And then we ported our nightly tests to run and just make sure that we're getting the correct results in the GPUs. And once we got to that step, we quickly realized that this history based transport was just not amenable to the typical GPU fine grained direct approach. And this is because when you're doing these particle tracking loops, you have a random number generator that's causing particles to undergo different events. You can think about every warp and thread, which on a GPU you want them to be doing the same thing. They're now doing different things because of this random sampling of events. It really does not uh, perform well in the GPU. What we've been doing to try to alleviate some of this is uh, event-based transport kernel splitting. So with the history-based method, as I mentioned, the particle, you just every thread of the GPU just models a particle history until it ends. And they're gonna be doing different things and it's, it's just not very performant. So we looked at is something called event-based tracking. And in event-based tracking, instead of modeling the entire particle history, we do particle histories in little segments. And so first we would sample what the next uh, event, the distance of the next event and what the next event is on a single kernel launch. And then once we know which particles are undergoing which events, which events are going to occur, we launch kernels, GPU kernels, just for those events, to process those events for the particles that are undergoing them. 
And once that event's done, then we go back to the original step. And I'm just showing here some of what our memory space looks like for, uh, for this algorithm in Mercury. And then we just continue this process until the particle history is complete. Um, now, this is, we found that this is much more performant because now with these event based kernels, particles are undergoing similar events. Yeah. Sorry, can, can I ask what's a GPU? The GPU is a graphical processing unit. So they were originally designed for uh, rendering graphics on for video games. Okay. What we found is that they work pretty well for a lot of scientific computing as well. Which is why, and they're much more efficient. That's part of the reason why you're seeing a lot more of them in these uh, high performance computing machines. Because if you want to get up to exascale, which is the scale that we're shooting for to do big simulations, it would require the power of a small city to do that with just CPUs. And that's just not feasible. So we moved to GPUs to get more efficiency for a competition. Okay, thank you. So while we were doing this event based uh, tracking implementation, we had other people looking at some other um, improvements for GPUs. And again, it's all based on this idea of trying to eliminate some of the thread and warp divergence. And so uh, we looked at sorting particles by cell. And the idea here is that if all the particles are in chunks of the same cell, they're going to be pulling in the same data, which is also something that GPUs like to do. And they're going to be undergoing similar events in those cells. Uh, one of the things GPUs like to do is pull in data that's you know, a thread will like to pull in data that's next to the other thread in memory to get good performance. And so we had cell-based data structures that had a bunch of information for the cell. We pulled those out and made each individual member its own stride one array, which we call mesh variables, to help with that memory lookup issue. Uh, when you're updating tallies for your Monte Carlo problem, you have to basically put a lock on the tally when a thread has to update, and all the other threads have to wait. And so one of the things we did is replicate our tallies, which takes a memory hit. But the idea is that if you have replicated tallies, there are fewer threads that have to wait for the other ones to update. And then you basically just merge the replicated tallies together at the end of the cycle. And then uh, NVIDIA has a cool tool called link time optimization. And so the linker can look at the code and optimize over the entire program instead of just individual compilation units. This is something that NVIDIA just ships with their newer compilers. And this was really cool because on our production executables, we saw a performance improvement between 25 and 30% just by doing this. So we looked at two problems, one for Mercury and one for Imp, to measure our performance on the GPUs over time. So for Mercury, we looked at a problem called Godiva in water. This is a static K eigenvalue problem where we have a chunk of a sphere of uranium surrounded by a sphere of water. And we just want to compute what K effect of this in this, uh, this system. So we ran for 10 cycles and we did 100 million particles per cycle. And in this particular case, this is a little different from uh, many Godiva water runs. We, uh, we meshed the problem into 8,000 cells. And the idea here is that we wanted to assess performance bottlenecks from just doing. Uh, collisions and also tracking through cells. See if you know if one of those was bigger than the other. And what this table here shows is we're looking at different <clears throat> combinations of CPU cores, GPUs uh, on our different machines. And so the Power Nine cores and the Volta One Hundred GPUs, and then we have other another machine where we have CTS cores. Where we typically see better CPU performance. I wanted to mention that as well. And so uh, these are. Orange performance figures here are what our GPU uh, performance improvements that we're now currently seeing. And it's about four and a half times uh, running on the GPUs. And I just want to mention here that we have a very specific way of measuring performance. We don't measure running this program on one CPU and then running it on one GPU. What we do is we measure running on a core, a full core, or sorry, a full node, which on CTS. CPS machine is 36 cores. And on zero, we have four mm -hmm. GPUs per node. So we do <coughs> one on one node and then we compare performance that way. If you were to compare just a CPU to a GPU, you'd see something on the order of like 30 or 50. 
So this is just we found that this is a better metric for us to use to measure performance. Can I have a question? Of course. Remember you said the eight hundred eight thousand cells. What what uh, geometry are the cells? And so you... they're well the the underlying CG geometry is all spherical. <clears throat> just two two spherical shells. Sure, no, that's the and then one. when we mesh it, um, yeah, the meshes I guess. Yeah, we're meshing it so that it approximates the sphere in uh, Cartesian geometry. Cartesian geometry. Yeah. Cartesian mesh. Cartesian mesh. Yeah. Yeah, so we we're really looking to just get really fine grained mesh so that we could really hammer the particle tracking on the GPU to see if that was a performance bottleneck. So then, do you have a lot of like on the surface of the interface meshes where there's two materials? Uh, so we, we have some cool um, features in our code where we can take a CG and convert it to a mesh. When we do that process, we can say, I want it to be conformal, even if it doesn't perfectly approach the underlying CG. Or you can say, just give me the closest approximation. If I get mixed material zones, that's fine. So this was with a conformal, so we didn't want any mixed material zones. What's the difference between the black and the orange speed up numbers? So the black, good, good question. So the black is compared to the power nine CPU cores, and the, the red or orange is compared to the CTS cores. And so again, we, the reason we brought in the CTS cores is because we tend to see better performance on those. The power nine CPUs, um, you know, the, the Sierra machine is really all about the GPUs. And they don't have necessarily the fastest CPU cores on that machine. So it's not necessarily a fair comparison if you just run on that machine. So why is the last one then? Uh, you have the CTS compared to itself? Do you have a. Yeah, this is comparing the CTS node to a power nine node in the black. In the black, yeah. I see. <clears throat> So we did a similar, or we did a different problem for imp, and this is what we call the crooked pipe test problem. So this is a pretty standard test problem that was developed by some, by some scientists at Livermore. There's a report on the crooked pipe test problem. And it's really just an idealized photon transport test problem. And so we have constant gray opacities everywhere, constant fatigue. So what we have is an optically thin region, and some optically thick regions, the idea is that the photon should mostly stay in this pipe. And because this is a time dependent problem, we want to measure what the um, basically the material temperature is as because from photons heating up that material at different points in the pipe as a function of time. And so there's a, an expression that's been found for these, these different points. So we can compare that to what our code is producing. And so for this particular problem, we have a 300 EV black body source of photons on the left side of the pipe. And then photons will um, transport through the pipe and into some of the, somewhat into the surrounding walls. Um, to test this problem, we ran 320 million Monte Carlo photons per cycle, out to 49 cycles. In this particular problem, we vary the time steps by allowing them to increase by 10% just to make the simulation run a little faster. And again, comparing CTS power nine nodes and the Volta 100 nodes, we see compared to our best CTS runs about a four and a half speed up on the GPUs kind of using this event based. So this, this, this took a long time to get there. The first couple of years when we ported, we were seeing a decrease in performance running on GPUs. And then over the years, it's been a very slow progress to get to this point. And now we're hoping to continue that. Do you ever run the event based on a CPU? We do. Yeah, we do run that on the, on the CPU. How much? Probably slower. It's a little slower, yeah. A little lot is it? You know, it's it's not slow enough to, to be really noteworthy, okay. but it's, yeah, we do see some. It's definitely one of the, and you know, it is problem dependent too. And so we have some control parameters. I'm leaving out the details. We have some control parameters that we found. You have to kind of tune in order to make it performant on CPUs and GPUs, and those control parameters are different. And so this is part of why I'm talking about bulk chunk size here, but this has to do with the number of particles we simulate in a, in a batch. And on GPUs, this, this number basically determines how much memory we're using on the GPU. We want to push that to its max, we found, in order to get optimal GPU performance. So the idea is that we don't want to leave threads idle on the GPU to get performance. 
So uh, moving on to the, the next technical topic, I want to talk about how we improve photon transport and mercury by incorporating an elliptical photon transport treatment. And again, this is something that my summer student and I will be doing a little presentation on at the ANS conference this summer. We have put in a presentation for that. So why, why are we interested in this? Um, so there are many photon sources that exist that require a general polarization treatment of photons. A uh, couple examples, you have synchrotron sources, which can produce linearly and circularly polarized x-rays. You can use these x-rays to do fluorescent and diffraction experiments. Uh, at Livermore, we also have sources called monoenergetic gamma ray, or just mega ray sources. And these can produce generally polarized gamma rays in a narrow tunable energy range. The desire is to use these gammas to identify uh, specific radio nuclides. And so one of our longer term goals with these sources is to do what's in the box kind of uh, simulation. So identify maybe some high Z material in, inside of the shipping container, for instance. Uh, another example would just be standard annihilation photons. You have a positron and an electron annihilate. Uh, you end up with not only two uh, photons, but these photons are per polarized perpendicular to each other. What's been found is that it's important to account for this polarization when you're simulating the accidental co uh, coincidence background in positron emission time. So until recently, the production version of Mercury film models linearly polarized photons. And uh, we wanted to be able to model all these sources, but we needed to be elliptical photon treatment. So for those of you who've done any particle transport, probably aware that you need to account for the energy, the position, the direction of your particles. Now, when you're dealing with polarized photons, you have two additional parameters. On the next slide, I'm gonna show a third, but these two parameters are, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, to define these parameters, it's best to just look at the path that's traced by the electric field of your photon as it moves through space. And I'm showing what this ellipse looks like in general. And the two parameters are this angle beta, which we call the ellipticity, because the tangent of that angle is the measure of the minor axis to the major axis, which defines the shape. And then we have this angle chi, which defines the angle of the major axis with respect to some chosen coordinate system. Now, typically we don't concern ourselves too much with this angle chi, but we instead store something called the polarization vector, which points in the direction of the major axis of the ellipse. And it's simply, you know, with your chosen coordinate system, we can find it by just taking uh, this equation. So in a Monte Carlo simulation, we don't typically keep track of just the ellipticity and the chi angle. What we instead do is represent this polarization state as a vector called the Stokes vector. And this, this is borrowing from the optics community. They do this, they do something similar. So the first component of the Stokes vector is just what we would call the particle energy or in Monte Carlo simulation, the particle weight. And then these second, third, and fourth quantities are related to the ellipticity and the chi angle with one additional um, parameter, which we call the polarization fraction. Now, in a Monte Carlo simulation, this polarization fraction acts as a variance reduction technique, and we can interpret it as the fraction of a particle's weight that corresponds to a polarized photon. Now, one minus P corresponds to unpolarized photons. So if you weren't to use this P, you wanted to model photons exactly like they operate in nature, what you would have is that during certain interactions, particles, when they become depolarized, you just sample a random polarization state. And when you do that, as you can imagine, when you're tallying, having all these extra random states flying around means that your variance is gonna increase slightly. So this works well in our Monte Carlo simulation to reduce the variance of the tally. As I mentioned before, we kind of have an arc, the, the chi angle is kind of arbitrary because you can just pick any coordinate system and measure the major axis with respect to that coordinate system. Now, if we take this, a, a different coordinate system where we just rotate the about the z-axis by some angle a, we can map our original Stokes vector to the, uh, the new coordinate system using this Stokes rotation matrix. This is going to be important in a second when we look at the 
transport equations for polar photons. So the polarized photon transport equation operates on the Stokes vector, not just the particle weights. And so the Stokes vector here oops, is again shown as this I vector. And uh, a couple of interesting characteristics of this Stokes vector, or sorry, this vector transport equation is that um, loss is still just from the total cross section. So that basically streaming to a collision site the Monte Carlo simulation looks the same for polarized photons as for non-polarized. That's not just our intuition. But scattering is governed not by a double differential cross section, but by a matrix. Now, uh, another thing to point out about this double for this this uh, transport equation is that it represents four coupled transport equations, <clears throat> one for each component of the Stokes vector. Now, if we break down the scattering matrix H, it's actually comprised of three individual matrices, two rotation matrices of the likes that I just showed, and this matrix called the Muller matrix. Now again, from optics, Muller matrices are used to characterize the optical uh, elements, optical filters. And so the particle scattering, an atom is just a different type of optical filter, basically. And we can determine what the Muller matrix looks like. This is outside the realm of my field, but using quantum electrodynamics. And so the Muller matrix for polarized photons is a known entity, and we can just pull that into our simulation. I'm gonna show what that looks like in a second. So why do we need these rotation matrices? Well, the Muller matrix only operates in the scattering plane, kind of like the double differential cross-section that we typically deal with in our Monte Carlo transport. And we typically measure a photon's Stokes vector in what's called the meridian coordinate system. Now the meridian plane is defined by the z-axis and a particle's direction. And the x-axis lies in that meridian plane. And we measure that chi angle with respect to that x-axis in the meridian plane. The sorry, the meridian coordinate system. What we have to do is we have to rotate by some angle that I'm gonna show out a calculate in a second from the meridian coordinate system to the scattering plane, which is defined by the particles incoming and outgoing direction. And then once we know the particles out, once we have that information, then we, we rotate again, the particles outgoing the meridian plane. So that sounds complicated and I'm gonna show how to simplify that. Uh, to, first of all, we need to know how to calculate these angles. And again, it seems like a challenging task. There's a simple way to do it. If you take the incoming and outgoing directions and record the points at which they intersect the unit sphere and the point at which the z-axis intersects the unit sphere. And you, uh, you draw the, what's called a spherical triangle that's formed by these three points. We end up with the following angles and relationships to the lengths of the sides. And we can use something called spherical trigonometry and the spherical law of cosines and the spherical law of sines to determine what these angles are. And I've just shown for the uh, the uh, psi prime angle here, applying this uh, spherical law of cosines and the spherical law of sines, what these angles are in relation to uh, quantities that define the incoming and outgoing directions. So Monte Carlo particle transport. We typically don't sample an outgoing direction from a collision in the global coordinate system. We define a local coordinate system uh, and then we sample the particle direction in that coordinate system and rotate back to the global coordinate system. Now with, um, when we're dealing with elliptically polarized photons, we do something similar. We just choose a slightly different coordinate system to uh, make this as simple as possible. So our local coordinate system is defined where cosine of theta prime is equal to one. That just means that the Z axis is aligned with our incoming direction. Uh, phi prime is zero and chi prime is zero. So these two just mean that the x-axis is aligned with our polarization vector. So it's important to note that this is not equivalent to the meridian coordinate system, but if we were to start the meridian coordinate system and rotate our x-axis to the polarization vector, we end up in this coordinate system. Now the meridian coordinate system is the one that we typically use in scalar transport to sample an outgoing direction. And so things are analogous, but slightly different for scalar transport. Now with these variables that define our local coordinate system, when we do the, uh, apply the rotation matrix for the Stokes vector, 
end up with the following uh, equation for our Stokes vector in the local coordinate system. So you can see it's been slightly reduced by having the chi vector or the chi angles terms drop out. And then when we apply, when we solve these equations for psi and psi prime in the local coordinate system, we end up with the following value for the incoming psi in the local coordinate system. And interestingly, the outgoing side in the local coordinate system is just zero. So that means um, we don't have to rotate after we're done with this process. We can just measure with respect to the scattering point. And so if we apply these two matrices to the incoming Stokes vector, we get the outgoing Stokes vector in the local coordinate system. So really quickly, again, this is, you can solve for this using quantum electrodynamics, but uh, this is what the molar matrix, so we treat think of photons as an optical filter. This is what that, this is a matrix that characterizes that filter. Uh, assuming that it's undergoing incoherent or coherent scattering. Now in this term on the front, we actually have the double differential cross-section from scalar transport. So this is basically just an extension of that to the more general case where you consider the polarization states of the process. So applying those two matrices that I mentioned before, we end up with the following equations for outgoing Stokes vector in the local coordinate system. Now, these equations for this discussion aren't super important, but I just want to mention that we still don't know what the um, outgoing direction is. We haven't sampled it yet. But once we sample it, we can apply these equations. How do we sample it? Well, we can construct a new differential cross section in the local coordinate system by taking, by just using the definition of what a cross section is. We take the ratio of the uh, outgoing distribution of particles to the incoming. And we end up with the following differential cross section that accounts for the polarization state of photons. I want to point out the characteristic of this. If we were to integrate over all possible phi angles, what we would see is that we recover the differential cross section for um, scalar transport, where you're not considering polarization of photons. And so, how you interpret this is that polarization only affects the distribution of azimuthal angles from scattering, it does not affect the distribution of polar angles. So, this is really convenient because it means that to sample the outgoing polar angle, we can use any of the established methods. So for incoherent scattering, we can use Kahn's method, Koblinger's methods, or one of Matthew's methods. And for coherent scattering, we can use first limit method. Now, when we go to sample the azimuthal angle, what's typically done in scalar transport, so we just sample uniformly from one over two pi. Now, when we convert this to a conditional PDF, we end up with the following new term, which just characterizes the azimuthal anisotropy of this distribution. And this, this term ranges from zero to one as well. So. Now, we, once we've sampled our uh, outgoing direction, we can determine the outgoing Stokes vector components, calculate the new polarization fraction, calculate a new ellipticity, and then calculate a chi angle with respect to the, the scattering point coordinate system. I just want to emphasize that this is different. This is not measured in the reading coordinate system. So we have to be very careful about how we define our outgoing polarization vector. So again, we need to rotate. Now that we've sampled our direction, we need to rotate it back to the global coordinate system. The scalar transport, we typically use the following rotation matrix. We're talking about Y and Z. But in, uh, in this polarization treatment, we have to rotate uh, with another rotation matrix. And again, this yeah. takes <laughs> this takes us from the reading coordinate system to the local coordinate system, where again our z-axis is still aligned with the, the, the incoming direction, but our x-axis is aligned with the polarization vector. And when you apply these rotation matrices and look at the column vectors, an interesting thing happens. The first column is just the polarization vector in the global coordinate system. And the final column vector is just the initial direction in the global coordinate system. And so we have, if we apply this rotation matrix to our outgoing direction sampled in the local coordinate system, we end up with the following uh, equation, which now only has sampled quantities and known initial quantities of the photon. And so it's 
and this is part of the reason why in Mercury, we, we actually store this polarization vector in the cup, easier to apply this matrix. Now, the last thing we need to know is the polarization vector. And again, what we need now is a vector that lies in the scattering plane and is perpendicular to the outgoing direction. What we can do is first define a rotation matrix that rotates us from our local coordinate system to the coordinate system we're interested in, which is where the z-axis is aligned with the outgoing direction and the x-axis lies in the scattering plane. We first define this matrix, and then we apply the matrix we just defined to rotate from the local coordinate system to the global. We end up with a new rotation matrix. And if we look at these three columns, this A hat S column vector lies in our scattering plane as we need. And uh, this B hat S column vector is perpendicular to both the scattering plane and the output direction. So it's, you can think of it as the X and Y in this other coordinate system. Now, when you actually tease these apart, what you'll find is that this, uh, this A hat S vector is also composed of quantities that we've either sampled or know in the uh, initial quantities of the, the photon. And then we can just simply apply our equation for the polarization vector with our sampled kind. And we get what the outgoing polarization vector is in the global coordinate system. Go ahead. Yeah, is that a cross product between the omega hat prime and the E? Yes. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so now we've, we've completed the, the sampling process for scattering of the polarized photons. And we can sample a distance to a new collision and then start this process over again at the next collision site. So once my summer student and I got this, this implemented, we needed some experimental data to look at. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot out there on generally polarized photons. And so what we instead did is looked at some experimental data from Mito et al, which on the reference down here. And they have they did an experiment with linearly polarized photons. And one of the cool things you can do with these polarized photons is you can represent beams as superpositions of other beams. And so we just took their linearly polarized beam and represented it as three elliptically polarized beams that we modeled separately and then some of the results. <clears throat> now this particular experiment, what they're interested in calculating is um, the absorbed dose in a soft tissue equivalent phantom. So they have a beam of photons that are polarized uh, directly normal to the surface of this, uh, this cube. And they wanna calculate the dose, a certain radius off the beam axis, and then parallel to the beam axis as a function of depth. And then they also do, they do this calculation that's um, what's considered zero degrees, so aligned with the x-axis, and 45 degrees and 90 degrees. And in this blue, you can think, try to remember these, uh, these color, the colors of these different angles, because I'm gonna, they're gonna correspond to the results that I'm gonna show in a second. So they also, in the media at all, this is a fairly old paper, they didn't publish their data, so we decided to plot our data on top of their published data. And so again, the, the colored results are the code lines of the results from Mercury. And then if you look closely, you can see squares, triangles, and circles. And that's the experimental data that these researchers collected. And at all of the radii of interest, one, three, and five, we see generally within one to two sigma agreement with the experimental data that was collected. And so this was, uh, for us, this was, we have some analytic test problems too, but for us, this was pretty exciting to see the uh, good agreement with the experimental results. Now, I just want to show one last thing on this topic. This is a great example of a problem where this kind of treatment is pretty important. If you look at, if we were to do this simulation without polarization and compare the results, when you do account for polarization, what we can see is that at zero and 90 degrees, the results when you don't include polarization um, are between 25 and 75% too high or too low. So in an absorbed dose calculation like this, let's just say you're doing some sort of treatment planning for a patient, something like that, having this kind of error in your results could be pretty catastrophic. So being able to account for this in certain problems can be pretty important. There are definitely some where polarization kind of washes out, it's not quite as important, but this is an example of one where it's, it's pretty important to account for. So uh, moving on to the final topic, I just want to talk about 
uh, improved coupling between him, our IMC thermal radiator transfer code, and uh, some of the hydrodynamics codes at Livermore, specifically in curvilinear coordinates. So what do we use these hydrodynamics codes for at Livermore? As I mentioned before, we have the National Ignition Facility. And in that, at that facility, we're taking these, um, what are called hall rounds, tiny little cylinders. And inside the cylinders, we have little pellets of hydrogen fuel. And this massive laser uh, comes in and shines on the inside of this cylindrical wall, produces x-rays, those x-rays then shine on that DT fuel and cause it to implode, um, ideally to the point where it starts to fuse the, the hydrogen fuel. And on the right here, what I'm showing is a, a 3D simulation of one of our hydrodynamics codes, where we model the implosion of this NIF capsule as a function of time. And so if you look on this axis, it starts out at 300 micrometers and at its peak um, compression, it ends up at 60 micrometers. That does this in a very short period of time, seven and a half nanoseconds to eight and, a half, eight and a quarter nanoseconds. So, just a this very brief introduction to hydrodynamics. Um, the hydrodynamics of a system are governed by basically three conservation equations, and this is in its most basic form as well. We have the conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. And so, within each cell, we're basically just modeling this. Um, these equations to ensure that these conservation equations are, are holding true. Now, as the system heats up, we're going to want to include heat conduction, but heat conduction for the, uh, you know, for NIF in particular, is not going to be sufficient. Uh, radiative energy transfer is usually the dominant energy transfer mechanism when these temperatures exceed 1 EV and the flows are, uh, we have radiated flows like this. Now, the reason for this is because photons travel at the speed of light. All matter particles only travel around the speed of sound. Uh, and in addition to that, photons generally have a much larger mean free path than matter particles. So what we have to do is we have to go back to our radiative transfer, or sorry, we have to, we have to go back to our conservation of momentum and energy equations. So we have to add radiative transfer terms. Now when we do this, we end up with what's called the radiation hydrodynamics equations. So in this, in the uh, conservation of momentum, we have momentum exchange rate between photons and matter. And then in the conservation of energy equation, we now have the energy exchange rate between photons and matter. So to get these exchange rates, we have to rely on a radiation transfer solver, radiation transfer solver. And we basically couple the hydrodynamics and the radiation transport together so that in one step we're doing hydro, another step we're doing radiative transfer, feeding that back in. So in, a, in, its, in its general form, the energy uh, radiation, um, <coughs> excuse me, the energy exchange rate between radiation and photons and matter is shown here in the top. And then the momentum exchange rate between radiation and matter is shown here on the bottom. And you can see right away that this momentum exchange rate is just the first angular moment of the energy exchange rate. So they are related to each other. Now this term, these I terms on top, are the intensity distribution of photons, which are governed by the radiation transfer, the thermal radiative transfer equations. And the B of T terms are the black body spectrum uh, of a material at temperature T. And uh, this, the sigma terms, we call them the absorption capacity, but they're very similar to the total macroscopic cross sections. On the bottom here, I've shown the two coupled nonlinear equations for thermal radiative transfer. The top governs um, the intensity distribution of photons, and the bottom is the uh, temperature equation for the material. You can see that these two are going to feed back together and uh, at the end of forming a nonlinear system. Now, this is there's a lot to lot to show on this. I just want to give a brief introduction to this. Uh, as I mentioned before, IMP implements the standard. IMC method, which was developed by Fleck and Cummings in 1970. So this algorithm has been around for a long time. And one of the problems, if we, if we try to linearize this without much thought, we end up with a, an explicit method for modeling um, thermal radiative transfer that's very, very unstable unless you take really, really small time steps. And so if you think about this conceptually, when you're modeling this in Monte Carlo, 
particles stream, they get absorbed, and then their histories end over that time step. So what you end up having, if, if you have a too long of a time step with a lot of absorption, the material temperature jumps up a lot, way more than physically happens. And then it feeds, a, you know, you get a feedback loop where now you're, you're going unstable. So what we do with IMC is Fleck and companies realize that, well, instead of doing modeling this exactly, what if we do what's called effective, something called effective uh, scattering and effective absorption. So basically, instead of saying when a particle is absorbed, its history just ends over the time step, we allow a certain fraction of those to be re-emitted by the material at a certain black body spectrum characterized by the temperature of your material. And so this first term up here is basically just the effective scattering term for these, these photons. So once they're absorbed, we allow a certain percentage of them to be re-emitted and we just treat that as a scattering process. Um, in terms of the, instead of the, we don't actually think about it as a temperature equation, but we think about it as a material energy balance equation. Instead of having the full absorption during that time step, we have absorption that's reduced by this flex factor F, which ranges from zero to one. And I just want to mention here that we have these subscript N terms. This is how we linearize these equations. We say that at the start of a time step, um, we take the values of these quantities and assume that they're, they're stationary over a time step. So because we now have a, uh, this implicit absorption in our equations, we don't actually model the absorption of photons. What we instead say is, uh, say is we're going to sample the distance to a scattering event, and then we're going to reduce the weight of the particle by the number that um, would have been absorbed, the expected value of particles that would have been absorbed. And this has a, a, very, a, a name, it's a very introduction technique, but it has a name called um, implicit absorption along the point path. And so every time we sample a distance to a new scattering event, we multiply the particle's weight by this following equation. Now, we can use this equation for the weight to construct a tally for the energy exchange rate just from particles moving from scattering point to scattering point. And so I find this term with an underscore TR. Now, there are additional terms. There's a term for material emission we have to account for, and a term from physical scattering. But we're going to ignore these because these occur at specific points. And so it's really easy to do the energy and momentum balance at those points. It's much more difficult to do it when we're doing this track. So the, the, the energy of a particle over this path, or the change in energy of a particle over this path, simply take this differential weight and multiply it by the particle's energy, which is just Planck's constant times frequency. If we integrate this over the path length, and with the following equation for the change in uh, photon energy in time, the energy exchange rate. Now, as you all know, the momentum of a photon is related to its energy by just dividing the energy over C. And so we can determine the differential momentum exchange rate, sort of the differential momentum change, as just the differential energy change over C because there's a directional component we multiply by the uh, direction of a photon at a specific point in space. Now, in Cartesian coordinates, this uh, determining the momentum exchange rate, basically doing this integral over path, is very simple because the direction of a photon doesn't change as it streams. However, in curvilinear coordinates, we need to now compute the radial component of the momentum, momentum exchange rate, or the radi yeah, radial, and then in cylindrical coordinates, we would also need the, the z component. Um, the, the direction of a photon, its radial direction can change. As the particle moves through space. And so it's not as simple to integrate this, the radial component in this integral. So before we get to that, how do we define the radial component of a photon's direction? Well, we can determine this equation by simply parameterizing, oops, parameterizing the position of a photon as a function of path variable s, projecting that onto the xy plane and then dotting that new RXY as a function of S into our original direction. And that gives us the radial component parameterized in this path through the S. Now, when we carry through this math, we end up with the following kind of mm, unwieldy equation for the radial component of the direction. But if we do a few more algebraic manipulations, we end up with the following equation for our radial component of the direction as a function of path. What we can see here now is we have this S minus S min term, 
And what this tells us is where along the path this direction is going to change. Now, because we're eventually going to need to solve this, or integrate this equation numerically, we need to know this because if we put a quadrature point right on that S min, we're guaranteed to get pretty accurate results. If we were to have it S min between quadrature points, we're going to get a jump in between those points. And so there's going to be some numerical um, inaccuracies. I just want to mention too that uh, this sign will only change if this dot product, so the dot product of the photons uh, direction projected onto the xy plane and its initial position is, uh, is negative. So that just means that there's some component that's headed towards the axis. And when it's headed parallel directly towards the axis, so it's perpendicular to the r direction, or sorry, per parallel to the r direction, you have parallel or anti parallel. We can reduce this equation further because r min squared goes to zero. We end up with the following equation, which is just um, we have the sine function. It gives us whether it's going directly towards it or away from it. So we're going to define a new function that we term we call the radial direction function. When we take that equation for the radial component and we pull in the uh, exponential term when that differential momentum change as I showed before. And then again, we're just I'm just showing that there are the two forms, the reduced form we can we can check, do some tolerance checks for the, the direction of a photon, and we can do a more simple integration than the numerical integration. So it's, that's why I tend to show this reduced form too. Now the z component in cylindrical coordinates doesn't change. So this one we can integrate directly. But the radial component, we now have to integrate this radial direction function over the path of the photon. And so we looked at various numerical quadrature schemes to do this integration because it's a Monte Carlo calculation and there are oftentimes millions, hundreds of millions, billions of particles. We have to balance speed and accuracy. So we wanted a full, completely accurate to you know, machine precision every time that'd be too expensive. So one of the test problems we looked at, we didn't went back to the crooked pipe test problem and we computed a related quantity. We didn't look directly at this momentum exchange rate for track uh, quantity. We looked at a quantity that's in the, in the realm of radiation transfer, sorry, thermal radiation transfer, we call radiation flux. In the realm of nuclear engineering, we call this an energy current. So we wanted to compute this quantity, which is directly related at various radial surfaces in the geometry. And um, I'm just gonna show the results at this uh, spherical. So you think about this, this is an RT geometry. So this is actually rotated around the Z point to make a cylinder. And we're going to look at a, a, a cylindrical surface um, that I call the right pipe bank. And what I'm showing here is the results of this calculation at the right pipe bank for the radiation flux using different quadrature sets. And we also ran a simulation with an XYZ geometry that was fine, very finely meshed to get another approximation of this answer that, uh, that we could compare against. What we see that using you know, the most naive possible approach, which is just to do a right Riemann sum with a single segment, we end up with a pretty poor uh, approximation for this quantity as a function of time. Now, going a little bit further, we had a default method, which is just to do 10 segments of a left Riemann sum. And that gets us pretty close as a function of time, the, the answer that we believe to be correct. And it's off by 10 to 20% for the most part. In some cases, about a factor of two. And then if we used Simpson's one third quadrature, either three points, five points, or seven points, we end up with a solution for this radiation flux that's very close to our answer in the XYZ change. So, what this means is that we can probably, for this problem, get away with just using a very, very cheap and very fast Simpson's one third quadrature set with three points. Uh, we did some additional testing of other geometries and we found is that we need to boost the number of quadrature points in some of those problems up to seven. Um, we found that once you got further than that, in fact, we actually have an adaptive method we could use to really hammer down the machine precision, it's very expensive. We found that we got the most bang for the buck when we were doing about seven quadrature points. So that's become our new default in, uh, in Inf to do these calculations. So he's, he's um, is that Simpson? you said the Simpsons rule seven points. So Simpsons one third quadrature set. 
And typically that's just done with three points, right. but you can extend it to any number of points you want as long as it's a odd number of points. And it gives you a little bit better, you can think about it as a polynomial fit. Three points gives you a parabola. You extend that, you're getting higher and higher order uh, polynomials. Extend the number of points. So what we're basically saying when we go to seven points is that typically this radial direction function is poorly approximated as parabola, pretty good as uh, like a four, what is it, fifth order polynomial, or seventh order polynomial. Just to summarize really quickly, um, we've, we've, you know, we've been doing a lot of porting work, GPU porting work on these codes, and we're finally starting to see good GPU performance using this event-based algorithm and some other techniques we looked at. And we're currently sitting at about four and a half to five times speed up on uh, the Sierra GPU. Uh, Mercury can now model explicitly polarized photons. And I just want to quick shout out. Uh, this work was really, um, it would not have been possible without the work of students. So Ethan Windsor, who was a master's student at Texas a and and then Jason Rodriguez, my summer student last summer. And then um, coupling between the infant hydrodynamics codes, you know, we've, we've improved this in curvilinear coordinates. Uh, we've integrated the Simpsons one-third quadrature set into our Monte Carlo transport algorithm. And we've, our default now, even though we can change it, is now seven points, that quadrature set. So, in the event that any of you end up with these slides, I just wanted to provide some references that I found to be really useful for some of these topic areas. Um, and then again, I just want to say that if any of you are interested in any of these topics, interested in finding out more about the work that's being done, this is just barely scratching the surface of some of the work that's being done at Livermore. You know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Paul and Doug both have my, my information. And then just, I again encourage people to check out the careers we're offering. So, any questions? All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it um, seems that you mentioned you built a software called Mercury. I mean, it's a PLL nails software. And then uh -huh. you try to use it to improve the performance of the GPU. So, <laughs> it it's might be a, a simple question. So. Uh, did you use the uh, use software to analyze the GPU design geometry, or you put it inside the GPU to work, make it work automatically? Yeah, so all this is driven by software tools that are provided by NVIDIA. So um, I think there's, I think it's called Insight, but they have some really nice tools that they provide for you with their compilers. And what you can do is you can run a simple, run one of these programs on there, and it shows you a breakdown of kernel performance and how, you know, if you're doing them asynchronously, where one kernel started and where another one stops, you know, how many, what they call occupancy, so how many of the threads in the GPU are actually being utilized in each one of those kernels, how much memory is being used. So, yeah, you really, like, to, to do this, you can't just take stabs in the dark. You can have some intuition as to where maybe the bottlenecks lie, but it's really, you really get big performance when you start looking at these tools and saying, oh, I see, like, this particular you know, this algorithm that I'm launching on the kernel is taking up way more time than I anticipated, or it's got really low occupancy or using way more memory than I thought. What can I do to refactor it so that I can, you know, change certain things so that I get better performance out of it? So, yeah, you, it's really important to rely on the tools that the, the Tyler vendors provide you. Okay. And also, you mentioned uh, this software can be coupled with hydrogen dynamic code. Uh -huh. So it's the hydrogen dynamic part of your code or it's two different codes? Yeah, so it's two different codes and imp is kind of its own thing that we developed in the Monte Carlo transport group. And then we communicate, we, we basically develop an interface in our code mm -hmm. that we can then, uh, these hydrodynamics codes can, you can pull in our, our code as a library and then they can do these radiation transfer calculations <coughs> by calling our interface that we've constructed. So they call an interface where they set the number of particles they want to run. They set some parameters about the geometry and the, um, the material composition and the material um, characteristics. They run the simulation and then our code, they get queries say like, all right, what's the momentum exchange rate that you calculate in each of these cells? The hydrodynamics codes pull those out from the interface and then they can do the hydro step where they now you know, move the material around calculate new velocities of the material, things like that. So, so when you say the interface, is there 
one direction interface or it's a it's, it's, two, it's two directional yeah okay so they they call us and then um well i guess you could think of it once the the, the hydrodynamics codes drive it so they will say okay here's the problem definition then they'll say okay now run the problem and then they'll say okay now give me all the talents so it's really it's kind of one directional but it's it's really being driven by the hydro yeah. thank you is that something like swig or something different so that's interesting um one of the hydro codes that we've been really doing a lot of testing in used to use swig because they're they're all python driven and they've since moved 